Girls, we don't run the world. But would things be better if we did? We find that polities led by queens were more likely to engage in war than polities led by kings. Moreover, the tendency of queens to engage as aggressors varied by marital status. Among unmarried monarchs, queens were more likely to be attacked than kings. Among married monarchs, queens were more likely to participate as attackers than kings, and more likely to fight alongside allies. These results are consistent with an account in which marriage Marriages strengthen queenly reigns because married queens are more likely to secure alliances and enlist their spouses to help them rule. Married kings, in contrast, were less inclined to utilize a similar division of labor. These asymmetries, which reflected prevailing gender norms, ultimately enabled queens to pursue more aggressive war policies. So if history is any indicator, at least according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, or at least this one paper they released earlier this year, um... No. The answer is no. Uh, we will not live in a more peaceful world with more female rulers. All signs indicate that they're um, either about as violent as their male counterparts or maybe even a little bit more. Um, and I guess if we compare um, Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump, um, it looks like women, at least if we're going to use that standard, I understand it's not a very great standard, but uh, definitely Donald Trump is a lot less war hawkish. Um, also, Hillary Clinton is actually guilty of moving forward and perpetrating countless uh, knife rapes against a bunch of men. So um, I don't know how many women Donald Trump would have to actually rape, like not just get falsely accused of rape, um, how many pussies he'd have to actually rape, but um, I can tell you it's a plural number, um, and it's, it's millions. He, he'd have to basically rape the entire United States in order to be as morally egregious as Hillary Clinton. And all of her supporters overlooked that. You guys are all a bunch of cunts. Women make up half the world's population, but only 22% of the world's governments. Really? Yeah, that's because they don't run. It's because they choose not to run. Here in the US, we don't even hit that. When it comes to women in Congress, we rank 73rd in the world, lower than Kenya, Namibia, and Ecuador. So why does it matter that women lead anyway? That's a great question. I honestly have no idea why being ranked 73rd is any worse than being ranked first. So please explain. It's actually a great question. Go ahead. Well, besides the fact that we are the bearers of life, women lawmakers bring something different and sometimes better to the table. According to a study of the U.S. House of Representatives, in a 20-year period, women sponsored more bills and attracted more co-sponsors to their bills than men. Okay. Those bills got more press attention and survived longer in the legislative process, too. Women also raised more money for their home districts than men. Raising money for your home district is not a good thing. That's a bad thing. It's actually an anti-social thing. It destroys communities. Essentially what it is, is it's socializing the costs and then localizing those resources so that all the people who are ganking the public and feasting off of vampirically draining the hopes and the dreams of countless families, those people, those assholes, have an incentive to keep it going and to keep the vote, you know, keep on voting to in order to get the, the benefits of it. In order for you to recover the cost, is too expensive because they split up a bunch of amount of people. And basically this is how democracy is just systematically, and we all just stab each other in the back and it just leads to inevitable chaos. Get it, girls. Women are much more can do and, uh, you know, less about the political theatrics and more about, well, how can we solve this problem? And finally, Mr. Speaker, I'm flattered that you're all so interested in my vagina, but no means no. Michigan State Representative Lisa Brown joins us now to talk about her controversial comments. Welcome, Representative. Thank you. So were you making or did you intend to make a rape reference there at the end? No, not at all. I can guarantee you if we right. were 51% of women in Congress. Kirsten Gillibrand invited Emma Salkowitz, a.k.a. fucking Mattress Girl, to the the fucking uh, State of the Union address in 2015, back in fucking January 2015, well after 
everyone with a frontal lobe knew that she had made a false rape accusation and then built her entire senior thesis around it and then Columbia University fucking enabled it, fucking enabled her defamation case. And guess what? They just fucking had to settle that shit. And the fucking, uh, the, the victim was actually vindicated. And she's never recanted. She's never taken this shit back. Kirsten Gillibrand, you are an enemy to all victims of rape and sexual assault and sexual violence, and you are an enemy to every single person who's been falsely accused as well. You're an enemy to due process. You're an enemy to everything that is good about the West. We wouldn't have wasted the last four years debating whether women should have access to You know, instead of being an advocate, like, just for yourself and your own drugs, you could just, like, end the fucking war on drugs. Contraception. Can, can we get one fucking female politician who has the balls to just, like, fucking step up and end the whole war on drugs? It's like Dr. Mary Rutt, or, like, the closest we got. Yeah. Ranks number one in women lawmakers. It's Rwanda. After the 1994 genocide that left around one million dead, the remaining population was 70% women. So notice how one million dead is a fucking genocide, and it leaves the population at 70% women, and this is like a footnote. This is just like a tiny little detail that she just glosses over in her little whinging about how fucking oppressed women are over fucking nothing. When like shithole Islamic countries say, oh my god, we're gonna rape all the women and kill all the men, and everyone goes, oh my god, I can't believe they said they were gonna rape all the women. Facing a huge power vacuum in government, women stepped up, ran for office, and got it done. Yeah, that's my point. Women don't run. It took a genocide for them to be like, okay, fine, I guess we'll do it. It's hard work. People don't like being politicians. Most people don't. And women have more options than men in terms of being able to balance family and their career. And basically they just, you know, the, the, the phrase I got from Hannah Wallen, it's snatching oppression out of the jaws of privilege. Classic example of that. Did you ever consider the fact that for, like, a man who wants to be a stay-at-home dad, you know, he faces a much greater stigma and has much more challenges than a woman who wants to just be a full-blown career woman? Absolutely. They passed common-sense laws allowing women to own property and open their own bank accounts. And they focused on laws protecting children and women. Uh, even though men are more likely to be victims of violence, imagine that. They also established a quota that at least 30% of Rwanda parliament has to be women. Over a hundred other countries have some sort of similar quota, including basically all of South America, Europe, and most of Africa. <clears throat> yeah, and that's just gender bigotry. That's just straight up gender bigotry. Sweden's party quotas were established back in the 70s, and that country is now revered as one of the best places to be a woman, with paid maternity leave so remember that classic definition of feminism that, you know, that it comes from the guy who says that society ought to be judged by how it, how it treats its women. This is literally what she's doing. This is, this is literally her standard for determining what's a good country. How good is it for women and only women? And one of the smallest gender pay gaps in the world. The wage gap is simply the average earnings of men and women working full-time. It does not count for different job positions, hours worked, or different jobs. It has nothing to do with the same job. It has nothing to do with discrimination. But having more women leaders isn't necessarily a cure-all pill for sexism. And it doesn't mean that those countries have more, say, reproductive rights. Our you can just force a man into paying for your decision. You can even statutorily rape a young boy and he'll be paying child support to his rapist. Argentina, Brazil, and Chile have all had female presidents, and abortion is still illegal. Has it occurred to you that there are pro-life women? Like, like that people have good faith opinions on both sides of that issue? Illegal. Bolivia rates second for women in government, but still, female politicians there are routinely subjected to harassment and violence. Even in progressive Seattle, Washington, the majority woman city council was inundated with sexist and violent hate mail after they voted down a mega sports arena. Uh, studies also indicate that there's like parity in online harassment among this is just like a remix of that type of issue that's that's retarded like like the kind of stuff that they say is sexist in regards to the other issues is so ridiculously petty that sorry i don't believe you i don't know maybe some of it was really vile but i've got fucking compassion fatigue and you guys all earned that and like all of us have compassion fatigue and and, and you, you, you did that, you did that to us. And like, this is a stupid thing to care about. The fact that you care about this means that you don't have real problems.
This is just like another band bossy. This is another sexist air conditioning. This is another man spreading or man existing or whatever. This is just another thing I'm going to add to the list of feminist issues to, to, to make meninist issues out of in order to mock all of you. It goes beyond politics though. Studies show companies that have more gender equity perform better than those without it. And female bosses create work environments that are more flexible and open to employee feedback. Female bosses are also more likely to engage in gender nepotism, where they favor other women and, and, and advance them that way. Um, and if they're anything like school teachers, um, studies have actually shown that male teachers tend to be less biased graders, um, as perceived by both male and female students. Um, and I'd imagine that a lot of that is rooted in the fact that women have an in-group preference and men have an out-group preference. And insofar as that is affecting school teachers, I would imagine that affects female bosses as well. So I'm very concerned that that if your kind of rhetoric continues, these female bosses are going to indulge in a natural tendency to be sexist in favor of women because they're going to need to mentally acknowledge that bias if we're ever going to combat it. Of course, not every woman is guaranteed to lead in the same way. And more than just quotas, a lot has to be done to position women for these roles in the first place. But it looks like with more women in charge, everyone wins. Can you handle that? No, by everyone you mean sexist, chauvinist women. By everyone you mean everyone who matters to you and it's only women. You're, you're a straight up gender bigot. And I, I see you for what you are and I'm gonna call you by your true name. I invite you to take a red pill and reclaim the half of your humanity that you're missing.